So that's one minute past. Um, so I'm going to just make a start into the slides. Candice, if you can just move us on to the next slide, please. So just some housekeeping, we will be sharing some polls and evaluations. Um, so for some, there will be a link uh, or a QR code that you can scan, and we will try and put these into the chat function as well. Uh, you can also use the chat function to make comments and ask questions, and we will endeavour to answer all the questions asked within the hour. However, uh, we don't plan on running over, so if we haven't answered your question by the end, we will respond separately to you. Candice is here supporting us today. I'm going to be talking you through the first set of slides and I will be handing over to Candice halfway through. Can we just go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And um, sorry, I should have said there as well that um, we are recording this today and the recording and a copy of the slides will be available on our hub page as well. So to start our overview off, um, we wanted to talk you through the safe staffing team um, that is with you through 24 into 25. So we have our chief nurse, Marie McKerry, our program lead, Stephanie Tom, our improvement support officer, Ashley Smith, and there are six, uh, sorry, three safe staffing advisors. We have Glo McLaughlin, myself, Melissa Cook, and Candice Aiken. And we're joined on the call today by Stephanie, Ashley, Glow and there's myself and Candice that are presenting. Let me go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanted to also talk you through what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at the act as a whole um, and resources that we have available. We're going to be talking very briefly um, about local and integrated authorities. We're going to be having a look at self-evaluation. And at the end, we will come to uh, any questions. If we can go to the next slide, please. So if we before we go any further um, and we look at our objectives, we're just asking everyone who um, can to answer this poll. There should be a link in the chat function. Um, it's one question. Has the implementation of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act 2019 impacted on your staffing practice? And there are seven answers to choose from. So I am just going to give everyone a moment um, just to answer that, just to let you know that it is anonymous. And this information, it just supports um, our program. It supports the development of events and webinars such as this. And it just helps us to know that we're reaching the right audience with the right message. OK, I will move on. So if we can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So last year saw the Safe Staffing Programme focus on sharing information on the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act 2019 across all services and organisations. We held close to 500 different events in a range of ways from online to in person and over seven and a half thousand people attended these. So full details of the achievements of the Safe Staffing Programme from last year can now be read in our end of year report. So while last year we focused very much on pre-enactment, our objectives set by the Scottish Government this year have changed. So you can see on the slide there are four objectives that we're currently working to. So that's to ensure governance arrangements and reporting are in place, to continue to increase stakeholder engagement, review and update existing supporting guidance, and explore how compliance with the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act can be reported. So as you can see, there is still, however, an emphasis on supporting the sector through the first year of enactment. If we can go to the next slide, please. So you should be aware that there are four parts to the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act. In terms of care services, it's part one, the guiding principles, and part three, staffing in care services that are most relevant. 
I am going to be touching on chapter 3A for services using a staffing method. However, at the moment, this is only applicable to adult care home services. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So this slide and the next slide discuss who the Act is applicable to, both in terms of services and staff. In terms of services, a care service is defined in the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act 2019 as a service mentioned in Section 47 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act of 2010. So what you can see in front of you is a full list of services the 2010 Act covers. And this isn't just early learning and childcare, this is adults as well as children and young people. Next slide, please. In terms of staff, the Act is applicable to, the new Act defines workers in a care service in section 11. So this includes working for payment or as a volunteer, working under a contract of service or apprenticeship, a contract for services or otherwise than under a contract. So this would include, for example, employees of the care service, agency and other temporary and contract workers, self-employed workers, those on apprenticeship schemes and other earn as you learn schemes. And it also includes all volunteers. And there's lots of useful information about supporting volunteers on the Volunteer Scotland website. It includes tips and templates that we feel that you would find particularly beneficial. Next slide, please. So if we look at part one of the Act, it provides the main purposes of the Act. So it states that those are to provide safe and high quality services and to ensure the best care outcomes for people who use those services. And we've constantly stated throughout um, the last year that it's the rest of the Act is about making these two main purposes happen. Next slide, please. So part 1B is where we see the eight guiding principles. And we know and appreciate the care sector already works to these principles. And we wanted to highlight this to you in order to relieve some anxiety, but also to empower you to think of ways in which you might already be reaching some or all of these in your practice. Next slide, please. So we had a lot of requests to hear more voices from the sector about how services might be meeting the guiding principles. And last year, during our events, we collected a lot of information um, that we have decided we felt would be most beneficial if we put into a word cloud. So this is an example of one of those word clouds. It looks at guiding principle seven, allocating staff efficiently and effectively. The answers that you can see in front of you haven't just come from the ELC sector, they have come from all the sectors, but it just gives you an idea of how people feel that they might already be meeting that, that service and that guiding principle in your own service. Full details of the word clouds and what we've put together for the eight guiding principles can be found on our hub pages. Next slide, please. So alongside the Act, Scottish ministers have also released a statutory guidance to accompany the Act. And we highly recommend that you refer to this document as well as the Act itself. So an example of the statutory guidance comes into play in 4.6 and 4.13. As it states here, you can see on the slide, when judging whether or not a service is safe, it doesn't necessarily mean no risk, and it may not even mean low risk. What we understand is that risks are an inevitable part of healthcare services. In many services, a level of risk is required and needs to be managed by both service users and staff to support children. Positive risks as defined in the health and care social care standards mean making balanced decisions about risks and benefits. And that's why we like to point that out. Next slide, please. So a big theme that runs throughout the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act is the focus on 
staff well-being. So let's consider what happens when staff well-being is not being taken care of. And I'm sure you can all fully um, appreciate and identify with some or all of the um, parts that we have listed on this slide. So staff may be more prone to stress, fatigue and burnout. Staff who are unwell will struggle to concentrate or work effectively, reducing the quality of their work. Poor staff well-being can increase absence rates and that might be due to physical and mental health issues. And when staff well-being is not prioritised, staff may feel less satisfied and they might stop trying and they might even leave the service. And importantly, any of this could have a negative consequence on care outcomes for people, uh, for children experiencing care. So if you look at a more positive note, improvement in staff well-being will lead to increased productivity, improvement, improving performance, a sustained workforce, better attendance, improved satisfaction and an increase in morale. And this is more likely to bring about what we're all wanting to do and work towards, and that's improving the outcomes for children. And again, like we say, this is one of the main purposes of the Act. Next slide, please. So that was part one of the Act. Part three of the Act places a duty on care service providers to ensure appropriate staffing and covers the training of staff. So this was previously covered by Regulation 15 in the Scottish Statutory Instruments. So just to let you know, Regulation 15, as of the 1st of April this year, was repealed. Inspectors are now inspecting staff against Part 3, Section 7 in terms of appropriate staffing and Part 8 in terms of training of staff in the Act. So just to reiterate, it's Section 7 and Section 8 that we're going to be looking at now that you're now being inspected against. Next slide, please. So when determining what constitutes appropriate staffing levels, Section 7 tells us that care services should consider suitably qualified and competent individuals in such numbers for the health and well-being of people, provision of safe, high quality care, and insofar as it affects either of those matters, the well-being of staff. The main message we imparted last year was that we reiterated that you're the experts on this. You know your service and what is required. You know if you're a support service, you may require a different number of staff than, say, um, a children's care service. So any ratios of staff to children given to your service at the time of registration or updated registration will still apply. The Act does not change any ratio numbers. Next slide, please. So what is meant by appropriate staffing at all times? So care can often be delivered over what we refer to as 24 seven. However, with ELC services, a lot of that care is going to be delivered um, either during the day at a nursery or perhaps an after school kind of basis. So it's whatever, um, however much time you dedicate to your service, that is what is meant by at all times. So the changing needs of your children might mean that care needs to be looked at um, more, say, in the morning or more, say, in the evening. And again, I go back to what I said in the last slide, that it's about how your service meets um, this particular part of the Act. Uh, different services are going to meet this Act in different ways. But you all need to be thinking about the nature of your service, the size of your service, your aims and your objectives, the number of people experiencing care and the needs of those people. Next slide, please. So part three, section eight of the Act states that any person who provides a care service must ensure that individuals working in that care service receive appropriate training for the work they are to perform and suitable assistance, including time off work, for the purpose of obtaining further qualifications appropriate to their work. 
So we have found some services this year, this year have picked up on the wording in part three, section eight. And we just want to take this opportunity to reassure everyone that this wording hasn't changed from regulation 15. So however your service was meeting this objective prior to enactment, you should continue to work in this way or take this as a time to reflect on your current practice. Next slide, please. So before we move on from the Act, you can see on the screen the Staffing Method Framework. So this is something you can access if you log on to our website or the Safe Staffing Hub page. And like I said at the start, I want to point out this is not planned to be used in every registered service type at this time. This is only applicable to adult care home services. However, there is a caveat in the legislation that Scottish ministers may introduce this into other sectors in the future. And this is why we still include it in our presentations and webinars. So the Scottish Government asked the Care Inspectorate to design a staffing method framework firstly for adult care homes. So what you can see on screen has been created in response to Section 3A of the Act and was designed through 23 and 24 in consultation with adult care home services and stakeholders. So this, this considers key elements around staffing that supplements the dependency tool if used when determining staffing levels. So it's important that providers and services don't panic if they see this being discussed in relation to the new legislation and think it's and think that it relates to their service. Again, this is just for adult care home services. It sets out a framework or process to be followed by a care service provider to determine what appropriate staffing is in any particular care service and setting. Next slide, please. So again, just to summarise, uh, it's parts, parts seven and eight that are enforceable. And we also say that care services must have regards to part one, the guiding principles that we have just covered. Next slide, please. So we're moving on from the Act itself now. We want to start talking to you through some of the resources that have been developed all brought together to support services and enhance overall learning and understanding of the Act. So one of these valuable resources is a learning and education resource that has been developed as a collaboration between the Act implementation team in the Scottish Government, NHS Education Scotland, HIS and the Care Inspectorate. So it's an accessible resource that enables people to learn about the guiding principles and different duties within the Act. So you can navigate through the, through the relevant learning resources and they are sorted by sector and you will find different websites and links to support your learning. So the information and detail within this resource will continue to be enhanced and updated to reflect emerging needs in services, including specific resources for colleagues working in the social care sector. So this resource has been used, been made using Sway technology. I'm sure that one of my colleagues has put a link in the chat for ease of access. Next slide, please. So again, here you can see further sector support and resources that we have produced. So we've developed physical cards for our in-person events during 23 and 24, and we still have some available. So if you would like some of these, please send us an email and we can get some sent out to you. However, we have also developed the cards into an MS Sway for those who prefer having something online. The Care Inspectorate Hub pages are full of um, different information that you can access. You can see here the image of posters. So these can be downloaded and put up in your service. There is one for each sector. So these are a great resource to share um, with your staff, but also share with parents if that was something that you were wanting to do. Each of the posters go through the eight guiding principles and they have just been tweaked very slightly um, for each individual sector. So they're all a great way to start um, some conversations again, whether that's with parents or whether that's with your staff. 
We have Q&A resources internally and externally, externally that have been developed. We have information guides, we have quick guides. We have full webinars on there as well as some bite-sized recordings as well. Next slide, please. So before I hand you over to my colleague Candice, who's going to take you through the rest of the webinar presentation, we're going to pause here just to complete two short surveys that will be put into the chat function. So we hope at this point that you're confident in a and you're able to access some of the resources on the hub that have been there um, for several months now. So we're really keen to hear which type and format of resource works well for you. Um, so it is anonymous. Please take your time. Um, and again, it just gives us some really good insight into what's working well for people. There is a second poll that's going to be put in there, and that's just a free text box. If you feel that there's something um, that you would like to see as a resource that you haven't seen already, that you would like us to work on or produce, please let us know. Um, and that's something that we will be taking away. So I'll just give everyone a few moments just to answer that, and I will hand over to Candice. Thank you. Candice, your mic is muted. Thank you, Claire. I'll start again. So moving on, I'm going to talk about the Safe Staffing Programs activities in this year and coming forward until 2025. We have started a subgroup, implementation subgroup, where we're talking directly to the sector. We're asking services to collaborate about what is working well, what have they implemented and what evidence are they using to support the Health and Care Staff in Scotland Act. We're going to be meeting every quarter and we've just finished our first subgroup meeting. We're also collaborating both with internal inspectors and external services and creating a podcast that we'll be releasing about the Act, how it's working and what people are finding useful. This is all to support your development and understanding of the Act. We're collaborating with the SSSC in developing further learning resources. Melissa just spoke about the staffing method framework and we've created a mobile web, web app that people can download. But we're also data mining all the information from inspections to identify any common themes which will inform any further development with regards to websites and web, webinars and resources that we can use to support the sector. So the other part of the Act that we haven't touched on yet is the reporting element for local and integrated authorities, which will be carried out on an annual basis. This information is for any persons working in a local and integrated authority that may be on the call. However, I still think it's interesting for services who provide funded places for children within the private sector to know how the compliance with the Act will be reported back to the Scottish Government. Each year, all local and integrated authorities will need to complete a template report and submit it to the implementation team. And then this will be forwarded onto the Scottish ministers for their annual report. You may be aware that the Scottish Government wants local and integrated authorities to use the template when sending information about compliance with the Act. And this template is to, report, uh, to rely on consistency and to help identify those risks and trends within the sector. There's only two questions you'll be asked to detail the steps taken to comply with the requirements of the Act and detail any ongoing risks that may affect their ability to comply. I don't want to spend too much time on the reporting for local and integrated authorities. However, as you may have some people on the webinar, I do want to um, refer to it. So all local and integrated authorities need to be assured that at time of planning or commissioning, 
care services have regard to those guiding principles. They're considering um, appropriate staffing. They ensure staff have appropriate qualifications and training. That they have regard to the statutory guidance which accompany the Act and have regard to any other guidance issued by the Scottish Government and Scottish Ministers. So when complete, completing these questions on the template, consider all services that fall within the list mentioned earlier and that you have been planned or secured within your financial year. So there's no requirements to keep reporting on services once they've been planned or secured until such time as existing contracts, agreements or arrangements are renewed and re re renegotiated. So this doesn't apply to services that are commissioned only to the commissioning of the service. So reporting question one for local and integrated authorities is, you'll be asked to detail the steps you've taken as an organisation to comply with all those parts of the Act that we've just gone over. You have to be sure that you have ongoing um, processes to assess this, to commission a service that providers have regard to the guiding principles, appropriate staffing and training, and any guidance. You can see the link here between what has been asked to deliver and what local and integrated authorities need to be sure of when they're going into contract with services. So the second question says, please detail any ongoing risks that may affect your ability as a partnership to comply with the duty set out. You should detail any risks of partnership that you have encountered and planning and securing your service. Think about anything that would affect the partnership's ability to comply with these requirements. Again, assuring themselves of their ability to align with the guiding principles and those two main purposes about staffing and training. So for example, you may have difficulty as a partnership when you're commissioning and assessing particular services with regards to the duties, staffing and training. And that might be because you don't have enough information about the service. You may have had incurred potential risks with their planning. There may be a shortage of providers in your particular area or a, a limit on the type of providers that within a partnership you may wish to have a contract with. So see some of the common themes that we're coming across um, when speaking to the sector. So the Act is not prescriptive on how you gather this information. It may be that you're already gathering some of this information through the current quality assurance processes you have within your local authority. But if you're not, then you need to consider how you're going to obtain this information. So you could, could consider looking at inspection or in joint inspection reports, though you will be aware that not all services will have had inspection in that relevant financial year. And the ones that have won't necessarily be evaluated on staffing. As you know, our inspection focus areas change annually. The Care Inspector database, which is online, may also be useful, or maybe you have previous commissioning experiences with the service. You will know what works best for your system and your current processes. Please be aware there should be no additional pressure on services around reporting. <laughs> So we felt it would be useful to have a few slides on inspection priorities for the year and how this might draw all the changes around the Act into the framework. We can understand how they might impact on you during your inspection. So for ELC in 24 and 25, these are the inspection quality indicators. We'll be looking at 1.1 and 1.3 in key question one, and one and 3.1 in key question three. So, of course, it all depends on the level of your service. For poorer performance services, the inspector, of course, can look at other indicators to supplement what they're looking at. And for better performing services, they will look at these two indicators as a minimum. But as all inspections go, they are based on intelligence and they are proportionate to what they find, and this can change but our inspectors will always come and tell you if they're sticking to the footprint that they're planning or if they're going to increase the inspection. This is just a baseline for you to understand the priorities for this year. So all of this is always based around intelligence. 
Self-evaluation is something services should be doing solely for the benefit, shouldn't be solely doing for the benefit of the care inspectorate. It is a tool to help services identify and evaluate where they need to target their efforts to support improvements and outcomes for people. The ELC improvement team have produced an introductory to improvement bite our sessions, which you can find on the ELC Improvements Hub. I'm sure one of my colleagues will be popping a link in the chat for you now. There are four bite-sized videos in this series, which aim to introduce and support you in applying quality improvement approaches within your own service. These sessions are designed to be viewed consecutively with short activities to support you in making sustained improvements within your service. I really believe this is a worthwhile video and bite-sized series to look at if you haven't do done so already. Now, in the context of care, self-evaluation is a continuous process aiming to deliver gradual improvements, prioritizing areas that have a bigger impact on outcomes for people using services or where there is risk of harm associated with under the performance. Irrespective of our role as the national scrutiny body, care providers will want to satisfy themselves and their stakeholders and funders that they are providing that high quality service. We believe the quality framework is a helpful way to support care, care services to assess their performance against our expectations of outcomes for children at with the inspection process. Again, one of my colleagues will kindly put in a link directly to our quality framework. We pop in these links into the chat just for ease of reference. I'm sure all of you have them already, but just so that they're directly linked to the top, to the slide. So at every inspection, we will assess what we call core assurances, and these are also in the quality framework for each inspection type. If we do have any concerns arising from the assessments of any particular core assurance, we would consider evaluating the relevant additional quality indicator for that core assurance. So you may come in, we may come in with a plan to look at two quality indicators, but as always, we look at the themes around the core, main core assurances. This is what will give us the information to inform any changes in the plan. This is proportionate approach and that we use to carry out the inspections with all core assurances and we sample and then decide if any further scrutiny or evidence is required. Now at the bottom of this slide you'll see an added core assurance and this is the new staffing core assurance this year. So it is new, it is currently in place, and it is an inspection guidance for inspectors as it is going to be in the quality um, framework once it's updated. You will see the wording around the staff and core assurance is making its way into the quality frameworks. But we've put it up for you to share with you today. It says that the numbers, skill mix, and deployments of staff are determined by the effective process of our continuous assessment featuring a range of measurements that are linked to the quality assurance. And that's the new staff assurance, and you'll find that going into the quality frameworks. I just want to re I want to bring in um, ratios, adult to child ratios within the ELC sector. One question that came in through the registration process is how does this impact? So as Melissa said before, the adult to child ratio is not going to be changing. It is still what you catch at your registration. However, this is a minimum. We spoke about this a lot when we were delivering these last years. Your ratio is a minimum. You need to be looking at the needs of the children, the skills of your staff, how you're deploying that staff. How does the flow of the day impact the amount of staff you need? And this really is approached by your quality assurance processes and your evaluations. And this could be changing on a regular basis. I would like to emphasize that evidence in the core assurance and evidence in the Act should not put any additional pressure on you or your service. The Act is not looking for any additional evidence or documentation. Please remember that high performing services will already be meeting the requirements of the Act and have the evidence needed. However, 
if you reflect on the act and these processes and you think there's uh, areas for improvement, then you can use the quality framework to support those improvements. Now, one of my colleagues will be putting a link in the chat now. The link is to your quality framework and this framework that every inspector takes out with them on inspection. Now, these are available to use for providers, like I said, and you'd really need to link your processes around that so that you're aware of what the inspection is going to be looking at. And of course, the self-evaluation guide and toolkits are very valuable and useful to your self-improvement processes as well. Now, this is the last slide, and I just really want to have a quick reminder here. We spent a lot of time in the last year talking about the Act and talking about self-evaluation, core assurance, inspection plans, and the key indicators and the key questions that are being used. But one document that's really critical and that you should have as part of your toolkit is the records that all services must keep. With the evidence needed in this guidance, we will be looking at those core assurances I've spoken about that you already provide and create a lot of the information around accidents, records, infections. And this document details all the records that you should keep with regards to care plans, to staff and notifications. It is really a good guide and basis on where to start your quality assurance processes and to look at information with regards to what you need to provide. It does give you that cause and effects information to help, to help look at you, your processes, your value, your self-evaluation and improvement work. This is just a little nod to say as everything is changing and there's a lot of information out there, don't forget about that core information that is really essential and pivotal to your documentation. So hopefully that will give you a little bit more insights and support to move forward from the information shared with the, in the Health and Care Staff in Scotland Act and what this means for your service. It is important the self-evaluation of the core assurances are based upon your improvements moving forward and then meeting the requirements of the Act. So that has brought us to the end of our presentation. If there's been any unanswered questions or if somebody wants to put something in the chat or come off mic, this is your time to do so.